In this video, we are going to be talking about the topics of chapter 5, which is titled Protein Purification and Characterization Techniques. Understand that when we look at inside of the cell, this is an area in which the landscape is very varied. When we look overall at this computer generated a landscape of inside the cell, understand that here is just giving you just an overview of all the proteins that are made and are present inside of the cell. As you can see, it looks like a rainbow. It has all kinds of colors because each of them is actually representing some of these varieties of proteins that exist inside of the cell. So you can imagine that in science, if you're trying to study proteins and you have to look at them in the context of inside of the cell, it can be very complicated just because it's kind of like looking at the life of one person within its community. So at times when we're trying to do studies into proteins, we do study it in terms of being a person within a community. But at times we may have to remove this person and isolate it and understand it as a whole before we understand its environment. So in order to do that in this chapter, we are going to be talking about different protein techniques. We're going to start by talking about how do we extract protein and purify them. Then we're going to discuss how we are going to quantify the protein that it is obtained. Then we are going to continue talking about techniques that help us isolate our protein of interest. And lastly, we will be talking about analysis techniques, which basically are going to give us an insight into the protein itself. So let's get started. If you're interested in studying a protein, you have to find a way to express it. And understand that protein expression refers to a way in which proteins are synthesized, modified, and regulated in living systems. So what does this mean at the end of the day? We know from the central dogma of genetic information that DNA, that nucleic acid, turns into RNA which is a different type of nucleic acid, and that's what leads to protein formation. So if we want to make a protein, we know that we have to start from DNA. One of the ways in which we can look at a target DNA is by amplifying it. And through the process of amplification, what that is going to give us is look at a particular sequence that leads to a protein afterwards. So one of the techniques that can be utilized to amplify DNA is through the polymerase chain reaction. In this polymerase chain reaction, which we have the diagram and we're going to explore in later chapters, specifically just to give you an overview at it, we are going to, if we look at it components of the reaction itself, and remember that PCR is the shorthand for polymerase chain reaction. As you can see, this looks like a chemical reaction, like the ones that you do in the laboratory, and it is. We're going to have a DNA sample. And let's say that I'm only interested in this little piece of the DNA, okay? Not the whole segment. I'm going to design primers that are going to excise, basically amplify the DNA that I'm interested in. So that little circle that I uh, put in there, we're going to mix it with an enzyme that will make the segment. We were going to put it in a specific buffer. We're going to add nucleotides in order to complement the area that we want. And at the end of the whole process, we're going to have specifically our DNA of interest. And remember that DNA of interest leads to making our protein of interest.
So once through the polymerase chain reaction, we have obtained the fragment of, or the DNA of interest, that's what is called the PCR product. So remember, this PCR product is going to be our DNA of interest that ultimately is going to make the protein. Now, we need in molecular biology a vehicle in order to put the segment DNA into a organism that is going to make more of this protein, okay? So what vehicle do we use? We use what is called a vector, okay? And a vector, as I just mentioned, is the vehicle for protein production. So where we have PCR product and vector, when we glue them together, that gives rise to a recombinant vector. Once we have a recombinant vector, then we can place it inside an organism, for example, bacteria, because here you have E. coli, which is a, a type of bacteria, and then that bacteria, we can use selection methods, and as you can see here, antibiotics can selectively have the specific bacteria that have our recombinant vector, okay? And understand that once we know that we have that bacteria with the recombinant vector that will ultimately produce our desired protein, then we can, um, we can get started with the process of protein expression. Now, understand that this whole system is actually lengthy. It takes a long time. And I actually found this drawing very accurate with how long the process is. As you can see, here what we have illustrated is that you buy your DNA of interest or you buy the DNA. Then you have to do PCR to only amplify your desired DNA for your protein. As you can see, we need to, after that, have the vehicle and as you can see, it tells you that you have to digest it. Yes, because ultimately we need to ligate it, meaning glue together the PCR plus vector. And as you can see, as we go along, the process of transformation is what we utilize to put recombinant vector in bacteria. Then after that, you have to plate it, incubate it. You have to do inoculation. Inoculation is growing in liquid media. So as you can see, we can keep on going. Then you have to shake it to grow some more. You have to create stocks. You have to then extract the DNA so you can have a backup. As you can see, this process the whole process. This is not a week's worth of work. This can be months of work. It can even be years of work. But I just wanted to give you an overview because in this class we do not have a laboratory, but the whole process, it can be complex. Now, understand that once we have our recombinant vector Inside our bacteria, we have selected for the bacteria that has the vector in it. 
then we can express the protein in many organisms. There is not one correct or best way to do this. It depends on your area of research. Understand that in order to express proteins, you can use bacterial cells, like it has been illustrated in the diagram. You can use yeast cells, insect cells, and even mammalian cells. Each one of these systems has its own complications. The main thing that I want to illustrate with this is that you can use different organisms for protein expression. So let's say that you have already selected your organism, you have expressed your protein. How do we actually get the protein that we want to study by itself, not in the context of the cell, out of that bacterium or that yeast cell? or that insect cell, or that mammalian cell. Well, that takes us to the process of protein extraction. So, the process of protein extraction, understand that it starts by cell lysing, basically breaking open the cell. And understand that another way of, uh, of saying cell lysis is homogenization. Okay, so when we are homogenizing, understand that there's different techniques of how to break these cells. And again, each of them have their own advantage. I'm just showing you the variety of ways that we can accomplish the same job. So the first method that you can utilize in order to lyse the cells is going to be through sonication. Sonication specifically breaks cells utilizing high frequency sound. We can lyse these cells using detergents and when we use detergents pretty much what the detergents are using is that it makes holes on the plasma membrane of the cells. We can also utilize a French press. And when it comes to a French press, understand that we are going to be forcing our cells through a small hole and through that high pressure, that's how the cell is going to break. Depending on what uh, you're utilizing, as you can see, a tissue grinder can also be utilized. And you can imagine that uh, a tissue grinder is gonna be like a mortar and, or, and pestle process in which, as you can see, you're going to shear cells between a close-fit rotating plunger and the thick walls of a glass vessel. So that's why I mean it's um, like mortar and pestle. Now, one of the ones that is not illustrated here is going to be freestyle. But in freestyle is because um, the way that it, it works is that you're going to be freezing the cells and inside of the cell, there is actually a, a mechanism a process. It's, it's not mechanical in nature because there's no instruments in it. It's more biochemical in nature in which that upon the action of thawing, then understand that the cells themselves are going to lyse. Understand that the end result of the cell lysis homogenization process is going to be to be breaking the cell. So at this point, we are only breaking the cell. So you can imagine that all the organelles are present. The plasma membrane is present. All the proteins from inside the cell are present. And even the one that you are interested in studying. So how do we separate all of this and only get the protein that we're interested in? Or at least we purify it in such a way that I, that we start getting more towards the protein that we're interested in and separating from the rest of the cell? Well, we could do this through the process of differential centrifugation. In this technique specifically, what we are going to be utilizing is just centrifugal force, meaning we're going to spin things fast. And when we are spinning, understand that because of overall uh, the this 
because of the speed, this is going to isolate the components one at a time. As you increase the speed, understand that that is going to create different sediments and these sediments are going to be different components of the cell. So let's go through an example. Let's say, let's say that you have already homogenized your cells and now you have a cell suspension. Again, this cell suspension contains the cell, all the cellular components, the protein that you're interested in, pretty much everything is in there. So in the first round of centrifugation, you can see that after you spin your sample, it with 800 G of force and understand that G is just going to be a unit okay for how fast we're spinning you can see that the sediment the first sediment that is created is the nucleus of the cell understand that every other component it is still soluble in this area which is known as the supernatant so what happens in reality is that on each of these steps we are going to have our test tube. That has the sediment. We're going to have the supernatant and envision that every time we do this step we are going to have to separate the supernatant from the sediment and forgive me this is not to scale I'm just doing the best I can with these drawings We're going to se separate the sediment and we're going to separate it from the supernatant And this supernatant is taken forward for further spinning. So I want you to envision that that's what is happening when I say, hey, we're going to um, centrifuge the supernatant. We took the soluble part and we kept on taking it forward. So, as you can see, in this differential centrifugation, in the second step, now we're spinning faster. Now we're spinning at 15,000 G. So, after we spin that, notice that my sediment now is going to contain the mitochondria, the lysosome, the peroxisome. And then, the, the supernatant, I take forward, and after spinning it, as you can see, for 60 minutes at 100,000 G, now I'm going to separate as the sediment, the plasma membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum, and understand that sometimes the endoplasmic reticulum, it is called the microsome. Now, in the last um, centrifuge of the supernatant, as you can see, when we spin it really, really fast, we have, we can obtain a sediment of the ribosome in the cytosol and this cytosol is going to contain soluble protein from the sample 